So I'm really I'm I'm really very sorry not to be actually in Swansea in person. I don't live extremely far away from Swansea now, and I was looking forward to coming. Uh, in any case, uh, and I'm sorry I'm not able to see all of you. Anyway, um, let me progress with the talk. So I'm going to talk about a couple of things that are actually quite closely related. Markov numbers, which are a very interesting uh, sequence of integers, positive integers, and the free group on two generators. Uh, this picture here is a, an arrangement which I'll be explaining um, with the Markov numbers written here in blue and also gathered up together in little triples here um, around the vertices of this tree. And here we have the first uh, quite large collection of Markov numbers written out here in red underneath. So what are these numbers? The first point, ah, something's happened to this. Yeah, here we go, right. So um, in fact, I'm going to be talking about three binary trees. So down here at the bottom, you see a binary tree. It's a thing, it may have a starting point or it may not, but at every end of every other edge, other than the initial point, there's a, there are two edges coming out and then there are two edges coming out or if you like three edges sticking out of each vertex and it just goes on till infinity. And we are going to arrange three sets of things, Markov numbers, rational numbers, and generators of the free group on two generators around this tree. That's what we're going to be seeing. So Markov numbers, what are they? Well, they're integer solutions of this uh, equation, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals three x, y, z. Of course, zero, zero, zero is a trivial solution. So let's ignore that one. Uh, there's another very easy solution. Um, if we set x equals y equals z equals one, you see one plus one plus one is three times one times one times one. So there's a solution. Uh, Let's get rid of negative solutions, stop worrying about them. If we stick in minus x and minus y, obviously x squared and y squared don't change sign and nor does three x, y, z. And so we've got another solution here. We could equally have x minus y minus z. But you know, we can't have only one of these three numbers negative because then the left side would still be positive and the right side would be negative. So we can dispense with worrying about negative numbers. The next bit's a bit more interesting. Supposing we have a solution and let's consider y1 and z1 to be numbers that are fixed and that x, y1, z1 is a solution. Let's think about what x could be. Well, if you rearrange this and plug in y equals y1 and z equals z1, you get a quadratic equation. So x squared minus three x times y one z one, and then plus something that's known equals zero. So remember the sum of the roots of a quadratic equation is minus three times the coefficient of the linear term. So we find x plus the other root x prime would be three y one z one. So we've already learned something. If we had one solution, then we can get another solution by replacing x by x prime, which is three y one z one minus x and y one z one. So we have a way of getting from one solution to another one. Of course, we could do the same thing uh, if we were to permute, there was nothing special about x, this equation is symmetrical. So we could just as well have permuted and had x one, y, z one and so on. So we could have done the same thing permuted so it's an old and famous theorem that we can actually find all the solutions if we start with x equals y equals z equals one, we can find all the possible solutions by repeatedly applying this simple minded move up to permutation. So we could replace y with three x z minus y and so on and so forth. So this is a famous um, equation which has led to really uh, a great deal of interest over the years. So the first thing is how on earth would you prove something like this? How would you prove that this is all the possible solutions? 
And there is a very beautiful proof of this. I'm not quite sure this is quite Markov's original proof, but I want to show you this, this really, uh, if you start thinking about it, it's not so obvious. So, right, well, you know, you can start with 111 and you can start applying this trick. You can, from the original solution, you can get three more like this and you can churn along and here's a list of the first few solutions and see they all come in triples and you can check, you know, one, two, five, you can plug them in the equation and check they work. And, but the beautiful thing is, it turns out that the solutions you get by this procedure, you can arrange around the vertices of a binary tree. So what are we going to do? Well, if we've got X, Y, and Z as a solution in the gaps around a vertex, then in the, opposite end of the fork as it were we're going to put x prime being the kind of dual solution that we've described here so we've got a procedure if we've got a triple round vertex if we went to this vertex say we could put in z prime which would be 3x y minus z so everywhere i get a sort of free edge i can continue and put something else so i've done it down here i started with 111 how did I get two? Well, I did three times one times one, which is three minus one is two. If I take a more complicated one, how did I get 29? Well, I did two times five, which is 10 times three is 30, take away one, which is 29. And so this picture, which um, somebody else drew, not I, not I, it's not so easy to draw these things. Um, they've kind of, put in at each vertex the triple that belongs around the vertex. So here we get one, five, 13. That's because we've got one, five and 13. And in that way, they've compressed the picture a bit more and gone up as far as the number three, seven, six, six, six. So that's a way of getting lots and lots of solutions, but how do we prove that that's all the solutions? So that's what I'm going to do now. So first of all, let's get rid of some sort of um, rather trivial solutions. So let's look into solutions if we had two of these numbers being equal. So suppose, for example, x equals y. Well, we plug into the equation, so we get 2x squared, or z squared is 3x squared z. And now notice these are all integers, so we've got a factor of x squared here and x squared here. So x squared must divide this one and they're integers, so x must divide z, so z must be a multiple of x, an integer multiple of x. And then we plug this back in this equation. You can go away and check this yourself. You cancel down and you find out two plus k squared is three kx. So we've got a factor of k here and a factor of k here. So we must have a factor of k here. So k must divide two, so k must be either one or two. And we plug that back in and with a tiny bit more work, you find out that the only possibilities are 111, which we knew and 112, which was easy to get. So we've got rid of these special solutions. Step one. Step two, we do something that's not quite so easy, but I'm not going to go through it. It's a little bit of algebraic manipulation. Supposing we have a solution and we arrange it so that now, now we suppose our solution is not special. So they're all different numbers and we arrange them so X is greater than Y greater than Z. And suppose X prime is the dual solution belonging to X. Then it turns out that the Y value is between X and X prime. So that's a little bit of manipulation, which isn't too difficult to do. Step three, now, now we get interesting. So here again, I've drawn this little part of the diagram again. I've got U, V, W round an edge, and I've got the dual solution to W here, W prime. And what do I do? I put an arrow pointing from W to W prime um, if W is greater than W prime. So of these two solutions, one or other, is going to be greater than the other one. And I put an arrow pointing from the bigger one to the smaller one. So in that way, every arrow, 
every edge, apart from the edges which come down to special solutions, are going to have arrows on them. Well, until, until we land in a special solution, we're going to have arrows. So we've got this tree and now it's got arrows on the edges. So what do we do? We start out with any old solution anywhere and round a vertex and there's an arrow pointing from X to X prime. So what I'm really going to do is I'm going to say, what, what I'm really doing here is, supposing I had a solution which wasn't on this tree, we could start out and make a completely different tree, right? We could just put it on the tree and then we could start out working our way out on this second tree with all these different kind of rogue solutions. But every time we see a tree, a, a, a triple, we can put arrows from the biggest one to its dual. And now there's a little claim. So the claim is, I think I've got a little picture here. Claim is that the other two arrows at V must point into V. So if X was the biggest number here, X would be here. I claim that these two numbers have to point into V. And this is a little bit of algebra. So this is really rather clever. We divide the equation through by three X, Y, Z and we change variable. So the equation had a sort of, it wasn't quite homogeneous, but we got a new variable Xi, which is X over three Y, Z and so on and so forth. And if we divide the whole equation by three X, Y, Z, you see you get this new equation, which looks much simpler in these new variables, Xi plus eta plus eta equals one. And from the dual equation, if we divide that by three Y, Z, we get Xi plus Xi prime is one. And same for the other duals. Now we had X was greater than X prime. So that means Xi is greater than Xi prime. So there was an arrow there, but that means that Xi, if the sum of two things is one and one's greater than the other, then the bigger one must be greater than a half. But now these other two, these three things add up to one. And if this one's greater than a half, both of these better be less than a half. And if these are less than a half, if eta is less than a half, then eta prime is greater than a half. And so the arrow goes from eta prime to eta. So it goes inwards towards V because eta was round this vertex here. And similarly for the other one. So in other words, the arrows all point inwards. So this is kind of a clever trick. So now what do we do? We keep going. We just follow, we start anywhere with our rogue solution. We follow down this rogue tree, but we know that we can keep going with this procedure till we arrive at some special vertex. And we know there's only two special things, one, 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 or one, one, two. And we know those were in the proper tree. So that's it. So I really like this little proof. This is where yeah. all the- Excuse me, Caroline, can I uh, interrupt you for a moment? There is a question on the chat. So would you be able to, uh, yeah. I, I will read it out. I, I'm I... You must read it because I can't see the chat. All right, yeah, no, no, sorry, no, no, I, I will read it out. Yeah, the question out. is, are these techniques related to Vieta jumping? Uh, yes. Okay, so they are... <laughs> I don't want to say more, but yes, they are. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. Right. So, um, something now. Right. So, I'm actually, I mean, I'm going to say a bit more about Markov numbers, but for the moment, what I want to say, there is a famous conjecture which um, seems to have been made in 1913. So sometime after Markov invented his numbers, uh, but a long time ago now, which is the following. Supposing we have two Markov triples, they're both solutions, and suppose the largest value in the two solutions is the same, but the other two are different. Well, potentially different. The conjecture says it's conjectured that if the largest two numbers are the same, then so are the other two numbers. Y is Y prime and Z equals Z prime. Okay, so in other words, the largest value in the triple determines the other two. 
So this conjecture goes back a long way. And I can say truly many people have tried to work on it, including myself and my colleague, Linda Keane. Um, we gave up after a while. It's still unsolved, but it, have been, it has been checked up, out re fairly recently. And this isn't very recent, but it has been checked out to numbers with at least 140 digits. So that's for the X here. There've also been various false proofs, which you can find in the literature. So if you find a proof, you better watch out um, whether it's a proof or not. Um, the best results I know was done by my former student, Jack Button, and he actually proved a simpler version of this uh, in his thesis. Well, I didn't, in his PhD, I didn't suggest the problem to him at all, but he came and showed me a proof. Um, so, he proved that if the largest number at X is the product of a prime power with some integer, and as long as the integer is less than 10 to the 35, which is pretty big, uh, then the conjecture is true. And the, the, this rather elaborate version, version of the uniqueness um, involves quite difficult number theory. In fact, a much simpler proof when X is a prime power was given more recently by these two people. And I understand there's a yet simpler proof around, but, but still only when X is a prime power. So uh, this is sitting there for anyone to come up with an ingenious method of proving it. So I want to now go on to the second part of my talk, uh, which is another thing with old, old history, free group on two generators. So, just to make sure we all know what we're talking about, um, commonly denoted F sub two. So we have two elements A and B in this group. And what it means to say it's the free group with these generators, it means every element in the group is a product of our A, A minus one, B, B minus one. Um, for example, this called a word and there aren't any relations except for the ones you have to have in order to make it a group. So no other relations. And for many reasons, actually, it's interesting to know what the generator pairs are in this group. So what's a generator pair? It's a pair of words in the group with the property that every element in the group can be written in terms of these two things, alpha and beta. So for example, if I take A prime and B prime um, to be my alpha and beta, and A prime I'm going to make just equal to A and B prime to be A times B, well, it's not very hard to see that you anything you can write in terms of A and B, you can equally write in terms of A prime and B prime. So because B can be written in terms of A prime and B prime and A is equal to A prime, so we can just substitute. Another simple example is if I, I took A times B and B. But for example, you can experiment. If you took A prime B prime to be A squared B squared, you'd find there were certain words that you would never manage to write um, in terms of A squared and B squared. So here's another way of finding, um, I've forgotten exactly what people call the Vieta moves, but this is also like Vieta moves, right? Um, and I've written something, no, no, that's right. I've written two, no, sorry. I, yes, yeah, that's right. These two are different, yes. Two other obvious things you can do. You can obviously take alpha and replace beta by its inverse. It doesn't make any difference. Another thing you can do is you can pick any old word in the group and conjugate your pair. And if you think about that for a little while, you will see you've still got another pair of generators. So um, following this example, if we had alpha and beta as a pair, then we could also have alpha, alpha times beta and alpha, beta, beta. So Nielsen's theorem is, it's a bit like Markov's theorem, you can get every generator pair in this way, starting from the initial pair A and B. Right, actually, I can't resist telling you, um, I actually did a bit of work in preparing this, tracking down Nielsen's original paper. Nielsen was Danish, 
But at that time, 1917, Denmark or the part of Denmark where he lived was actually under German control. And Nielsen was fighting in the First World War um, on the German side. And he actually wrote this paper. Well, the heading of the paper in German says he's in the fields, which I suppose means he's in the field of the war. And then the, the place where it submitted from is Constantinople, which I thought was fascinating. How you could write a paper in the middle of the war. But, uh, there we are. Um, so in order to say anything about the proof of that, well, I'd say a little bit about his proof. I'm not, I, I could explain the proof to you, but I'm not going to do it in detail, but let's have a bit of terminology. If we have a word which is, can be paired up with another one. So a W where I can find a V, so V and W are a generator pair, is called primitive. And what we want to do really is list all the primitive elements in the free group. So we may as well get rid of cancellations. So we say the words reduced. And there is no point in listing all the conjugates of a pair of generators. So let's just assume that we don't repeat those. We want ones that are really um, different from each other. Um, in particular, if we don't want conjugates, we can assume that W cyclically reduced because um, if we have a word that starts with e something and ends with its inverse, then that's like a little conjugation and we may as well just take the, the V that I've written here in the middle of it. So we cancel down as much as we can. And in particular, a trick if you haven't seen it, if we have a word, this is a product of generators, if I pre-multiply by E inverse and post multiply by E1, that's I conjugate by E1 inverse, then I get from E1, e, E2, EK, E1. So it's as if I'd cyclically permitted this. So actually there's no point in listing cyclic permutations. So with all of that, now how did Nielsen prove his theorem? It's kind of bare hands, um, maybe clever bare hands, but he shows that if you do suitable amounts of cyclically permuting and cancelling to sort of simplify the problem. Let's imagine we've got a generator pair with alpha being the longer one. Then he shows that after he's done his, his tricks of cancelling and so on, then alpha either begins or ends with either beta or beta inverse. And what that means is we can shorten it, in other words, um, by one of these basic moves. I'm not sure I've written this down quite correctly. Um, I've written this the wrong way. I should have written, yeah. Anyway, one, of the, one or other of these basic moves applied to this pair alpha will be written as alpha prime beta, for example, and then we can shorten it. So we go through the shortening procedure and we keep going. So here's an example. I just wrote something down. I happen to know this was a generator pair. Um, so I start with this pair miraculously a b squared in this case it's actually both the beginning and the end of alpha i get rid of the beginning one and i come down to this and then a b squared is at the end of here so i get rid of that so i get a b a b squared and now see i've got a b at the beginning of the longer of the two so i get rid of that and then i get down to there and if it wasn't a generator pair and you tried to do this at some point you'd get stuck it wouldn't work Right, so that's a sort of rough idea of his proof. And in virtue of his proof, we can arrange all these representatives of all these generators or all these um, uh, primitive elements around a binary tree. So how's this working? I'm only going to put down one representative of each conjugacy class, and they're going to be filling in the, the gaps between the branches of the tree. And if you look, across an edge, you will see a generator pair. So we ignore the red bit for a moment. Let's see, we've got B and A, they're a generator pair. And from that pair, I can move either to B, A times B, or I can move to A, A times B. So somehow these really come in a triple. And so to get this one, I've got B and AB opposite sides and edge. So they're a pair. And from B and AB, 
I can come to AB squared. Um, also from B and AB squared, I can cancel out and come to AB and so on. So you can mess around with this tree. And what you find out actually is that these words have really fascinating patterns called Sturmian sequences. It turns out that every primitive word has a very special pattern of A's and B's, um, which come up in lots of places in mathematics and dynamics in particular. Um, anyway, I'll say a little bit more later how, how you have to be a little bit careful doing this, what order you concatenate things. Um, let me come back to that a bit later on, but we can find a tree in which every single primitive element up to conjugation and inverses represented exactly once. And on the other side of the tree, we just get um, things with negative exponents for B. So I want to tell you another viewpoint because I want to be able to tie this all up with rational numbers. So the more modern proof I think of Nielsen's theorem is you map F2 to the sort of abelian group on two generators, which is the group Z2. So we have a word and we're going to map it to the point with integer coordinates mn in, in Z2, where m is the sum of the exponents of a and n is the sum of the exponents of b. So for example, here's a word that I just wrote down. So we just imagine that this was all commutative now. So we find we've got a squared a minus three a three, which gives us a squared and b squared b inverse gives us b. And so that would send me kind of psi of this word would be two, one. So if I took the inverse of a word, the order doesn't matter. I just get minus signs everywhere. So I'd get minus what I did before. And if I had two words that were conjugate, well, to conjugate, you multiply by G and G minus one and the exponents in G and G minus one cancel out. So I would get the same answer. So I've kind of got rid of this conjugation business. So primitive is one of a generator pair. So the theorem is that any primitive element maps to a relatively prime pair of numbers. So this is a very nice theorem. Primitive elements belong to prime, relatively prime pairs. And if we have two primitive elements which map to the same thing, then they must be conjugate. And then, so there's a corollary. We really want to classify primitive elements up to conjugation and taking an inverse is not a serious thing to do. So we're going to say things are equivalent if they're conjugate either, so W prime is equivalent to W if it's conjugate to either W or W inverse. What this theorem really tells us is there's a bijection between the equivalence classes of primitive elements and rational numbers. And I just had arranged all the primitive elements around a tree so equally, I can arrange rational numbers around a tree. Now I could have started with this because this is really the very easiest thing to do. You can arrange rational numbers around a binary tree as well. And it's sometimes called the fairy tree, although fairy was not a mathematician. So how do we do that? <clears throat> we take two rational numbers and we say they're neighbors if PS minus RQ is plus or minus one. And this should make you think of the Euclidean algorithm. And of course, that's where what makes a lot of this work. So we take, for example, two thirds and three fifths, two times five minus three times three is one. So these are neighbors. And now if two uh, rationals are neighbors, then I can add them up in the way that you're absolutely not supposed to add rational numbers. So P over Q plus R over S is of course P plus Q over R plus S. Uh, for example, two thirds plus three fifths would be two plus three is five and three plus five is eight. So I can add them. 
And now notice you can easily check out that if P over Q was less than R over S, this quantity is in between these two. And in fact, this one together with this one are neighbors and this one together with this one are neighbors. So we've done something similar. We had a pair of things and from that pair, we generated two more different pairs. It's kind of what we're doing in all these processes. And th this, I dare say you could prove this sort of like I proved the, the Markov theorem, but anyway, you can quite easily show that you can get- Excuse me, Caroline, uh, there, there is oh, another yeah. question yeah, in the chat. Yeah. So uh, is yeah. this, the question is, is this addition well defined? Yes. Oh, okay, you have to, you, why not? I mean, I'm just doing it. I mean, it's an operation. I shouldn't really say it's addition. Um, you count zero, treat it just like any other integer. So, so yeah, yeah, if you have one over zero and zero over one, sorry. Um, to add one over zero to zero over one, you do one plus zero is one and zero plus one is one. Okay, and um, after that, you'll never get any more one over zero. So you just treat one over zero like infinity and forget your worries about infinity. I hope that answers the question. But just a, an operation and you can, you know, I should probably have learned how to do tech and write a different symbol here, but I didn't. So um, can, you can check what I say here easily. Thank you. Okay. So now you can arrange all these numbers around the same tree. Um, we start with one over zero now and zero over one. So, so let, me, let me do an easier one without the zero on the bottom. So for example, two over one plus one over one, or plus in inverted commas, two plus one is three and one plus one is two. So I get three halves. Two over one plus three over two gives me five over three. Um, what else should we do? One half plus two thirds gives me three fifths. So you can just carry on with this and you will discover that if I go around the circle in this direction, like this, that's where I wanted to annotate it, but I can't. But anyway, you go around a circle in the anti-clockwise direction and you find all the rational numbers coming out in their correct order as you go around. And we do have a slight ambiguity. If we want to include negative fractions in this, we have to allow that infinity is also minus one over zero. And now we can start having minus one over one and just think that the minus sign is in the denominator. So for example, up here, I'd get minus two over one, and then I just get the same as on the right-hand side, but with minus signs everywhere. So this is a nice picture of the rational numbers. Um, right. So of course, um, these two pictures are very comparable. That seems obvious from the way I've done it. And the way, because going round here in the anti-clockwise order gives me fractions in the right order, it turns out to do this consistently, which isn't quite obvious, you should imagine you're going round the circle and you always concatenate the one which is further um, first in anti-clockwise order. So you put W first and then W prime. So. Um, to get from this pair to this one, I put this one first and I get this. Okay. So I've got these two trees nicely connected. What, how can we connect up Markov numbers and this tree? So uh, I didn't just choose these topics just because they're binary trees. Okay, let's make the connection. So we have to start thinking about matrices. Um, two by two matrices with, well, in general, complex coefficients and determinant one. Of course, if this has got integer coefficients, this is closely related to rational numbers and um, being neighbors. The trace of a matrix is just the sum of the diagonal entries. And you may know the good thing about trace is it's invariant under conjugation. So with two by two matrices, you can just multiply out trace of AB is trace of BA, and discovered that conjugation doesn't change the trace. 
there's some more relations between um, traces, which go back also to the 19th century. And these look complicated, but they're very useful because given two things in SL2C, repeatedly applying these things allows you in fact to find the trace of any other elements at all by these kind of polynomial operations. So the first one says trace of AB plus trace of AB inverse is the product of the traces. And the second one is a bit more complicated. It relates the trace of A, the trace of B and the trace of AB to the trace of this product, which is the commutator of A and B, A, B, A inverse, B inverse. So we have this somewhat complicated formula. And if, I mean, maybe it's unlikely, but if this trace of this happens to be equal to minus two, then this part of the equation cancels and I get this equation. And lo and behold, this equation looks extremely close to the Markov equation, suspiciously close. Well, the Markov equation wasn't quite the same because this equation is sort of like x squared plus y squared plus x squared equals x, y, z. So it's missing the factor of three. But if we divide all these traces through by three, then it cancels down and we get the Markov equation. So what does that tell us? It also tells us this other move. If we did the same with trace of AB inverse, we would discover from this trace relation that Z plus Z prime is three X Y Z. So we found the dual as it were that belongs to the trace of AB is the trace of AB inverse. So this is extremely like the Markov equations. So if we could find matrices A and B, whose traces were one and a trace of AB were, sorry, three, because we've got to divide by three. And if the trace of the commutator was minus two, then we would be getting the Markov numbers. Well, here's the answer. If we choose this one for A and this one for B, you just calculate out what A times B is and you see trace of A, trace of B and trace of AB are all three and you multiply out and the commutator has trace minus two. So, okay, you may say this is a miracle, but I knew the answer. So we've got three traces, three AB traces all equal to three, the trace is minus two, divide by three, we get the basic solution of the Markov equation. So we've got a connection between Markov equation and uh, traces. Now, how can we get all the other solutions of the Markov equations? Well, we, of course, we, we've already seen how to do that, but, but it's very similar to the tree of generators of the free group. So supposing we start with the tree of generators of the free group, and one of the generators say was some product like this, then let's substitute in for this product in the Nielsen tree, these two matrices, capital A and capital B, we stick them in and then we multiply it all out. And then we replace the big word we get by its trace divided by three. And what you're gonna get, well, it's kind of obvious from what I've said, we can find the tree of uh, Markov numbers from the tree of traces by starting from these, um, doing this exactly this procedure, dividing everything by three and starting from this triple. So really the interesting thing about this is it's a sort of tight relationship between Markov numbers and traces of matrices. Um, I actually, I mentioned um, at the beginning, I had to go at proving the Markov conjecture so actually these two matrices have uh, geometrical meaning in terms of hyperbolic geometry. They, they generate the fundamental group of a once punctured torus. And uh, we were hoping that we might be able to somehow use geometry to prove the conjecture, but uh, no such luck, we didn't succeed.
Okay, so now I want to go on to say something. Um, the things I've said, well, this theorem goes back to 1955. They're all... Um, old history, I want to spend the last few minutes just bringing things a bit up to date. So we did this procedure with these special matrices and we got these special numbers, but actually why shouldn't we just pick any old two matrices? We could pick any arbitrary A and B two by two matrices with determinant one, and we can substitute in the Nielsen tree of generators Sorry, that's meant to say, this is wrong. And so it's supposed to say, oh, this is just a misprint, just cross this out. A, A cubed B, A cubed, this is still wrong. Well, I hope you understand what I'm saying. This one is, is sorry, this, this one is actually not, not, not quite a generator. Um, let, anyway, let us say, you can just, whatever you see in the Nielsen tree, Substitute the word you get from these two matrices and then find its trace. Uh, Caroline, I think you wanted to say A cubed B A cubed B A cubed and so on. So there is I a. Think I wanted to say A cubed B squared A cubed B. Oh, B, B squared. B. Okay. I wanted A cubed B. A cubed B, A cubed B. It's very delicate. I mean, I know what the patterns are, but um, it's quite okay. delicate. What the patterns are. Um, I, I was just looking at the capital, you know, the matrices. And that yeah, was, no, yeah. somehow I, I put something and I changed it and I clearly changed it completely wrong. Um, anyway, it doesn't, I think you get the point. I, I take one of these primitive elements, I stick in, substitute in my matrices, and then I find the trace. Now, to know the scope of what we're doing, um, there's a nice little lemma that says, given any three complex numbers, actually we can always find a pair of matrices so that this works. And the proof is so simple. It's simple once you get it. Um, the proof is <clears throat> you just write down a matrix, which obviously has trace X. Another one has trace Y. The tricky thing is to make sure trace of A times B is Z. Well, you can check it out if you want to, this, this works. The trace of the commutator is not necessarily minus two when you do this, but um, nevertheless, you can do this. So what it means is we can start from any three complex numbers and we can run through the tree of traces. It doesn't actually matter what the trace of the commutator is. You can prove that the trace of the commutator is a, um, an invariant of the tree. Given X, Y, and Z, then if I take any other triple of matrices, I'll get the same commutator. So we can run through this tree and we can just look at the collection of complex numbers we get and ask questions about it. Well, and of course this is kind of well set up for computer work because you can just, you know, at any, once you've got one of these, you start generating all the other numbers. So you can run through to any degree that you want. And there have been various beautiful applications and uh, a, a lot of questions. So some of the questions have been answered, but many of them have not been. So the typical kind of question is, if we take the group generated by this A and B, is it going to be a free group? And if it's not, what are the relations? Another question, if you know what it means for a group to be discrete, a discrete subset in here, you could ask, is the group discrete? And that turns out to be a very fascinating and delicate question. And there is in fact, a lot of geometry behind this, um, which I don't have time to go into, but what I would like to say, um, it's one question I came up against recently um, and I was playing around with the question and then I found somebody had already got there before me, um, but only very recently. So the question is, supposing I start with X, Y, and Z, is it possible that I only see finitely many values appearing? I mean, I'll see an infinite number of entries, but maybe I only see finitely many values. And if you think about it, okay, even if I did see only finitely many values, 
it might not be true, it might or might not be true that the groups you get are finite. And this is the part that really bothered me. Um, so here are two examples. So here I started out with the innocuous looking triple zero one one. Um, if I did one one one, I'd be getting, well, okay, zero one one is sort of innocuous. And actually you follow it round. So for example, to get this entry, I do zero times one minus one, which gives me minus one. Here I go minus one times minus one, which is minus one minus zero. So I put minus one here and I go round. Well, you can very quickly see it. Just, you're never gonna get past plus and minus one and zero. Here's another one where for some reason I chose root two. Now I could have chosen root three, but I chose root two. And again, if you go through this procedure, um, so for example, here you do minus one times minus two is root two, minus root two is zero, so we put zero. And again, if you play with this, you're very quickly convinced that you're not going to get more values than this. So um, if I wrote down a group whose traces were zero, one, generators, whose generators were zero, one, and AB had trace two, would that group be finite? So to answer this question, we need to look at a special subgroup of this group called SU2, special unitary two by two matrices. So what are these? These are matrices of this form, A, B, minus B conjugate, A conjugate. This just says determinant is one and A and B are complex numbers. And this is the relation if you've come across unitary matrices, M times its conjugate transport pose is the identity. So why do these matrices come into this question? Well, this group comes in when we take the sphere and we stereographically project to the plane. Now I haven't drawn exactly what stereographic projection is, but I rest a sphere on a plane. I pick a point on the sphere, I pick the North Pole and I join those two with a line and I extend them and they hit the plane somewhere and that's my image. So stereographic projection is a way of mapping the sphere onto the plane. And a key property of stereographic projection is it doesn't preserve distances you can see, but you can see it does look like it preserves angles. Incidentally, you can buy one of these little models, many other things made by Henry Siegerman, if you look online, if you just look for his name, make beautiful, most beautiful things. Okay, so if we were to rotate the sphere around, um, keeping the, the tangent, so we, we can move the sphere, but we make, make sure when we put it back down again, we've got the same tangency point at the, as it were, the origin on the plane. Um, we induce from a simple minded mapping on the sphere, we induce some map on the plane and it's an angle preserving map. So in fact, it's a linear fractional transformation. Um, and in fact, the group that comes up is precisely the, the rotations here precisely are the, this subgroup of SL2C, that's why it comes up. And in particular, just a simple one, if we just would rotate around the vertical axis here, then obviously what we do to the plane is we rotate the plane. So we rotate the sphere by a, a, um, around the vertical axis by an angle theta, then we do a rotation on the plane around the origin, which looks like this, and remembering that SL2C acts in this way by linear fractional transformations on the plane, you see that the matrix that represents this thing on the plane looks like this. And what you should particularly notice is that instead of theta, we've gone to theta over two and we've got a theta and a minus theta. If you just write this down, you'll see that this checks out. So we come to this matrix representing a rotation around the vertical axis. And the trace of this matrix is this sum, which is twice the cosine of half the angle. 
Now, the beauty of this is that even if we were to do a different rotation, which was around a different axis, that will involve just conjugating. To find out what, what it is in SU2 will involve conjugating. And for what I want to say now, I only care about traces, so I don't have to care about it. All I have to say is if I rotate by an angle theta around any old axis on the sphere, I get an element in here whose trace is two cosine theta over two. So if I would rotate by pi on the sphere, I would get a trace two cosine pi over two, uh, which is zero. If I rotated by an angle of two pi over three, I would get a trace two cosine pi over three. Well, cosine pi over three is a half, so I'd get one. And if I rotate by pi over two, I'd get two cosine pi over four, which is root two, aha, I've got root two. So I've got zero, one, and root two, which were the values up to plus and minus in the examples I showed. So here is the theorem. The theorem which I've, before I got around to actually proving it, I found it's part of a much more general result in a neat paper that only came out this April. Um, basically says the finite trees that you can get are associated to regular solids. Those are the finite groups of rotations of the sphere. And there's one exception which is involved the dihedral group, which means rotate about the vertical axis and also um, uh, having two rotations in the equatorial plane at right angles. So, so a sort of um, the equator and a, and a line at right angles to the equator uh, and rotating there. So there's, there's a little exception, which is quite interesting, but basically finite trees belong to regular solids, homomorphisms of the free group into SU2. So um, my last slide, armed with that, you say, well, what are the other regular solids? So first problem for you is figure out what solid, what regular solid this guy comes from and this guy comes from. I'm not going to do that now. And then when you, that's how I arrived at this. And then when you've done that, you think what other regular solids there are? Well, there's the icosahedron. So the icosahedron has 20 faces, each of which are triangles and they've each got angle pi over five. So what I've done here, so we're certainly going to get something to do with rotation by, um, something to do with pi over five or two pi over five. So what you do is you find a triangle on this rather beautiful picture of um, the icosahedral group. So this is a one of the basic triangles. And as you see, it's subdivided uh, in this way. And you can get all the symmetries by all the reflections in all the sides of these black and white triangles. And if you want to keep orientation preserving symmetries, you have to take the index two subgroup. So you have to do products of two, rotate, two reflections to get rotations. So if you think about it, so we have this triangle, we've got a rotation of order. Um, so we take this triangle, say this white triangle. So here we've got, um, if we rotate by two, we're going to rotate the thing onto itself because we're going to map the white onto the white. Here, if we rotate by five, two pi over five, we're going to rotate back onto ourselves. And uh, here we've got, where's the other one? Sorry, um, this, uh, this vertex, this vertex, we've got two pi over three because the, the, the black and the white correspond to the possibility of doing an orientation reversing symmetry. This is what it looks like projected onto the plane. And so you figure out you have these trace values and uh, this is, lo and behold, the tree that you get from these values. Um, now you have to do a bit of algebra, but omega is two cosine pi over five. Now you have to do some um, 
work with De Moira's theorem and figure out that this number satisfies this quadratic equation. And lo and behold, when you go through all of this procedure to fill in these traces, um, it works out. As you do it for a little while, you will see that you start repeating yourself and you're only going to get finite values and that belongs to this group. So I think that's very beautiful. I was very pleased with myself when I came up with this example, I have to say. Um, <clears throat> Right, so that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Caroline, for this beautiful uh, talk. Uh, so we can all express our uh, thanks by using reactions and there is a, a possibility of clapping your hands. So please be free to clap your hands. Uh, in the meantime, I will stop recording. Yeah, I would like to stop sharing because right now I can't, for some reason, I can't see all the chat and everything.